I'm Samantha Shokin, Manager of Public Programs at the Museum of Jewish Heritage, a living memorial to the Holocaust. Before we, we begin, a few words about this institution. This is the third largest Holocaust museum in the world, offering a range of rigorous and engaging exhibitions, programs, and resources. In a world of rising intolerance, anti-Semitism, and Holocaust denial, we are called upon to be bolder in our mission of education and outreach than ever before. I'm pleased to welcome our speaker for today, Ruth Zimbler. Born in Vienna in 1928, Ruth bore witness to the destruction of the largest synagogue in Vienna during Kristallnacht. She and her brother were part of the first kinder transport out of Vienna, a rescue effort to bring Jewish children living in Nazi-occupied territories to safety in the United Kingdom. We are honored to have her share her story with us today as part of the museum's Kristallnacht Memorial Programming. After her talk, there will be time for questions, so do save them for the end. Please take this moment to silence all mobile devices and avoid disruptions during the program. Thank you. Please join me in welcoming Ruth, Ruth Simbler. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be in this lovely, lovely museum and to see all your lovely faces. I, I teach, uh, so, so, so to speak, teach children here on a regular basis. Uh, high school kids, middle school kids. I don't like them too much younger than 11 because it's a difficult story. As you heard, I was born in Vienna on February 22nd, 1928, which made me exactly 10 years old when Hitler marched in on March 12th, 1938, when he decided that Austria belonged to him as well as Germany did. And of course, the day he marched in, things changed for all of us. I'm gonna give you some dates I don't expect you to remember them, but I give, I give them to you only because I want you to see how little time it took to change lives. So here we are, March 12th, 1938. Hitler marches in, and two or three days later, it was time to exchange the books that I got out of the library every two weeks. So Mama took me to the library, and at that time, the librarian said to me, you can't have any more books. And I said, why? I didn't do anything to the books. I didn't scribble in them. I didn't tear any pages. And you gave me books two weeks ago. You can't have any more books because you are Jewish. I said, I was Jewish two weeks ago. <laughs> and you gave me books. She said, don't ask any questions. You can't have any more books. Go. So Mama and I went. I have a picture on the board, which shows my third grade class, which I brought because it was the last time my life in school was normal. Third grade, nine and a half, 10 years old, and Everything was as it should be for any normal person. My living uh, area was unusual. My father was a, uh, a um, social service expert at the Jewish community, and therefore we were assigned an apartment. Where are you? Where are you, Samantha? There you are, there. Would you say it, please? We had an apartment in the building on the left of the synagogue. Do you see the gate that connects the synagogue with the building? My apartment was on the ground floor, and it looked directly at the synagogue. The synagogue itself was a work of art. It was built in 1853, 
and it was a jewel. Can I have the next slide, please? Look at the inside of that place. Is it beautiful or is it beautiful? And we lived right next to it looking at it, looking at the beautiful stained glass windows. This was the largest synagogue in Vienna. We had almost 100 synagogues in Vienna at the time. There were about 200,000 Jews there in Vienna. And this synagogue was the biggest. It had 2,240 seats. So that's a big place. And it had been in operation since the 1850s, as I mentioned. So there was the apartment, and we watched everything that was going on. So every day after March 12, 1938, something else happened. The next thing, after this going, uh, this, this tobacco with the library, which really bothered me, because it's still bothering me to this day. I, I, I just, as a 10-year-old, certainly couldn't understand why. And it, and I still don't know why. I don't know why. So the next few days, they said my mother couldn't go shopping uh, for fruits and vegetables that came back, came in from the farms before four o'clock in the afternoon. Well, every, you know, we didn't have any refrigeration in those days. We had a cold <laughs> space, a cold room, and every woman who ran a household who cooked used to go shopping first thing in the morning when the fruits <coughs> and vegetables came in from the farm. By four o'clock in the afternoon, they were all, you know, they were all droopy, and, and, and um, they had no refrigeration to show them either. But Jews couldn't shop before four in the afternoon. Every day, another little indignity. My father was stopped in the street because there had been an election campaign before Hitler marched in. And since we had no television and very little radio, they used to paint with washable paints in the gutters. They, they, their jingles and their, uh, uh, their, their bywords and their symbols were all over the, uh, the pavement and the gutters. So they gave my father and not many other Jewish men, particularly those in the good neighborhoods, and those who were professors and doctors and lawyers who were well dressed. They picked them out and they gave them a pail of soapy water and a scrub brush and they had to get had to get down on their hands and knees and scrub the streets and scrub those things off. And they called them the scrubbing parties and they'd stand around, the Nazis would stand around and they'd laugh. But what, ha what it was for us was now, my father used to come home from the office at 1 o'clock every day, have a big lunch. You know, we had our main meal in the middle of the day. And I have two hours, and then he would go back at 3 o'clock to the office till 7 o'clock in the evening. My mother was standing at the window waiting for him at 1 o'clock. And when he didn't show at 1 o'clock, she knew that something had happened because something happened every day. Well, luckily, he had a wonderful sense of humor. And he came home and said, so I washed the streets. But it was an indignity. It was an injustice. It was not right. So things went on like this for a couple of months. And then came a real big bang. And that was they told me I couldn't come back to school. There was a school that was three trolley rides away from my house where they would send the Jewish kids. Well, my parents said that they wouldn't have any of that. So they sent me to an established Jewish parochial school, which was only one trolley ride away from the house. And I went to this school until the end of the term and that was, of course, in July. So from May 
to the beginning of July, I was there. Funny thing, my, parent, my mother and my brother, who were six, by the way, four years younger than I, and not yet in school, used to go to the country every summer for six weeks. Usually we, we had an apartment in a small town or we were on a farm, we stayed on a farm in a small town. And we would be away for six weeks. And I can remember so many of them from the time I was four years old. That summer I can't remember. I don't know what happened. Someday I'm going to have to go under hypnosis or something and maybe find out what happened that summer but I cannot remember whether we went away, whether we stayed or whatever. So in September, we picked up again and we went, I went back to school and things were as normal as they could be, which was not very normal at all, but we got sort of used to it. We got used to all these injustices day after day. Came November, and yesterday was the 85th commemoration of Kristana, and it was the night of the day that was going to be the 10th of November. And I don't know if many of you know the background of Kristana, do you? Can I see your hands if you do? A lot of you do, a lot of, I'll do it quick. Um, a young man named Greenspan lived in Paris. He was 17. His parents lived in Germany, but they had been born in Poland. And they were deported. And he could not find them. So he went to the German embassy in Paris and asked one of their minor officials how he could get in touch with the parents. And the guy fluffed him off. He said, go, I'm not going to tell you anything. The next day he came back and he happened to get the same one and the same story. The third day he came with a revolver and he shot him. And it looked like he was going to die. Now Hitler had been planning something big against the Jews for months. But he had to have an excuse. And this was it. Von Reich was going to die, one of mine is going to die and there's gonna be a lot of Jews that are gonna be sorry, and they're gonna die as well. And so we had in our building four families who had a connection with the Jewish community. For example, the chief cantor of all the cantors in Vienna, he taught them all, lived in the building with his wife. His assistant lived in the building with his wife and two children. And two families whose, uh, fa whose husbands were gone, but they had been involved with the Jewish community to a great degree. All of them were in our apartment at dawn on November 10th, 1938. They were whispering. Walter, my brother, and I tried to hear, but we couldn't hear. And I think if we could have heard, we wouldn't have known either what was going on. As the sun came up, the caretaker of the synagogue, who was not Jewish, who lived in the other building on the other side, which was part of our community there, said to my mother, Frau Munch, and get the kids out of here. So she packed a little bag for us and she took us on the trolley out into the Vienna woods where my father had an elderly aunt. She was 72, now I don't think it's so elderly. <laughs> <clears throat> but she lived there uh, by herself and she had space for us. And my mother brought us out there and she left us there and went back into the city. Tante didn't, uh, we, we didn't, we were in her apartment more than five or six hours when this big, I can still see him, this big burly Nazi came in and he said to her, you Jewish sow, you get out of here. This is no longer your apartment. This is now mine and you get going. And she said, I can't go anywhere to take care of these children. He said, I don't give a damn about the children. You do what you want with them. I don't care. 
but you get out, it's my apartment. So she cried, but she took our uh, suitcases, my little suitcase, and she packed it, and back she took us into the city. We go into the city, and we go into our apartment, and the apartment has an oak door that opens in the middle and has panels. And over the center of the oak door, there's this big paster, and it says, do not enter, with the swastika and with the German seal. No mama, no papa, nobody's around. We don't know what to do. We go out in the street, and along the street, and this, remember the synagogue and the two buildings adjoining at my home, and the other one took up almost the whole block. And we see that the fire engines are all lined up, one after the other, and the firefighters are standing next to them. The fire inside that synagogue is raging. The flames are going through the roof. And you know, I asked all the children always to imagine this, but recently I got some help. They don't have to imagine it anymore. You must have all seen the fire at Notre Dame. And if you saw that fire, this was it. This is what I saw my synagogue going up with those flames going up. And you can imagine how a 10-year-old and a 6-year-old felt when they saw this. This was so frightening. And it was so not understandable for any of us. I still can't understand it. And these firefighters are standing next to a fire engine doing nothing. So my aunt went over to one of them, and she asked him about my parents. And he said, listen, he wasn't unkind. He said, listen, they're probably in Poland already. They're probably somewhere where you don't know or where you can't find them. You'll have to take care of the kids. You'll have to do something with them. And she said, why aren't you putting out the fire? He said, we have orders not to touch this fire. But if something around it gets lit by the flames, then we'll put out those fires, but not these fires. Well, by this time it was dark. It was about 5, 5.30 in November, as you can tell. It's getting so dark so early these days. And the people who lived across the street, who were friends of my parents, waved us up. We went up there and they fed us and they put us to bed. The aunt was so anxious to go back to her place, but they didn't let her go back until the next morning. And miracle of miracles, she got her apartment back. That guy had no legal right to, to uh, displace her. He just decided that he was going to do this because so many of them got away with this kind of stuff. So, so he, he had not been in the apartment. He just told her he was going to go into it. But she had the apartment back, and she lived out her life in that apartment, even through the war. So here we are, up there on the fourth floor at our friends. We don't know where our parents are. And you know, the, the, the telephone is locked into a locked apartment, and there was no way of communicating. We didn't know where Mama was. Papa did. We just certainly didn't know where Papa was. What had happened was when my mother took us out there to the country, um, my father and our housekeeper, Marie, were in the apartment. And they took them both to the central police station and questioned them. And they let Marie, of course, go because she was not Jewish and they took my father to Dachau. My father had a unique talent. You know how some of the documents that, they, that the, that the uh, government um, issues uh, are crazy, crazy documents? You say to yourself, who made them up? What kind of language are they using? Because it's a language all their own. My father could figure out any of them and he had a wonderful handwriting. 
And at that time, in, in, um, at that point in time, uh, Hitler wanted to get Jews out of the country. He wanted to make Germany and Austria and Czechoslovakia Judenrein, clean of Jews. Um, so he, they weren't thinking of, of the murders yet. They were only thinking of the, making the Jews get out. So my father uh, knew how to fill out all these documents of the people who wanted to leave. And so he was working day and night. So what they did was, the Nazis, they're not so stupid, they went to get him to start working on these documents again. So after 36 hours in Dachau, they came and got him and they said, who works with you? So he said, this one and that one. This one actually did, that one was his brother. So he was able to get his brother out and they took him back, took him to the office. My father had a couch in the office, so he slept on the couch and had no way of, of finding us or knowing where we were. So um, he, it took three or four days before we were connected. We, on the other hand, my brother and I, looked out the window the next morning and we saw my mother wandering in the street, looking. She's wearing the same clothes she wore the day before. And they called her up. She came up and was surprised to see us because she surely thought we were safe out there with the Tante. Well, so she had slept down the street one night and the superintendent told her she could sleep there one more night and then he would report her. She, so she was wandering from one place to the next. Also didn't know where my father was. We were locked out of the apartment for 10 days and the walls of the synagogue were still standing, the brick walls. Everything inside was burnt out. The, uh, by the way, I, I forgot to tell you one thing which I still feel every day of my life. And that is the, the crushed glass of the stained glass windows when I walked on it under my feet. You all have walked on, on um, glass at one point or another. And that crunch that I feel every day of my life with those gorgeous stained glass windows all over the street. So we stayed with these wonderful people for 10 days. And after 10 days, with a lot of help from a lot of people, we got back in the apartment. Now, remember I mentioned to you that the doors were oak and they had panels? Somebody had knocked out a lower panel on one side and had cleaned out the apartment. We didn't have bedding, we had no blankets. And it's November, it's cold in Vienna in, in November. And we had no Judaica, no silver, <coughs> no jewelry, no clothes. Everything that wasn't not nailed down was gone, including what my mother was happy about, a bird cage with two canaries. So we were glad they took those so they didn't have to die. And we had to replace these things and with the help of friends and with money we, got, we, we replaced these things. So now we are in November, on November 20th, right? And November 20th, we, we got back together again. And, um, and we, I, I went back to school. And the evening, the Friday afternoon of December 9th, I came home from school. Excuse me. Sorry about that. And my mother was ill, she had uh, strep throat, and there were a bunch of friends of hers in the house, and they all had boxes of chocolates. And I said to my mother, what's going on? Why are they here with chocolates? It's nobody's birthday this week, nobody's birthday next week, and it's nobody's birthday last week. Why are they here with chocolates? There's no reason, they just came to see me to see that I'm all right. And she's sort of, sort of nervous, and I keep saying, 
Mama, what's going on? Something is going on. What is it? Finally, finally got out of her that the next day, my brother and I were leaving on the first kinder transport out of Vienna. How many of you know about kinder transport? Okay, that's great. Met most all of you. It was the first kinder transport from Vienna on December 10th, 1938, Saturday night. And my, as I told you, my mother was ill, so my aunt came to take us to the train station. My father was already there because he had to check off the kids. And of course, you can imagine the mood uh, on that train station. 400 kids and their parents, and each one of them a different attitude toward what was happening. The parents heartbroken, all of them. The kids, some, oh, it's going to be such a big adventure, we're going someplace else. For me, it wasn't a big adventure. I didn't want to go in the first place because I didn't want to leave my parents. But it was, uh, when I th think back on it, I realized that it was a real uprooting. Here I was leaving everything that was familiar to me, everything that I loved, all my things and all my parents, my friends. I was going someplace to a foreign country that, whose language I didn't know, whose people I didn't know, and I had no idea what the future was bringing. So I was very, very <coughs> ambivalent. And of course, I had to take care of my little brother. He was six years old, and he was very immature, very cute, but very immature. <laughs> and still is. <laughs> he's, 80, he's going to be 88 next week. <laughs> so anyway. So, so here were the two, and my aunt was taking us, and the space between the, where the synagogue stood and my house was still open. It was an open pathway. And my aunt walked us to almost the end, to almost the gate that you saw, and she said to me, Ruth, you go over to the walls and kiss them because you'll never see them again. Well, until that time, I was okay. You know, I mean, this is what was happening and that's it. When she said that to me, I lost it. I really, really fell apart. And this six-year-old pipsqueak said to me, Ruthie, if you don't stop crying, I'm going to cry too, and then there'll be a lot of trouble. So I had to stop crying. So she took us to the, um, the, to the um, um, train station, and we said goodbye to my father, and he said to me, we'll see each other in six weeks. Well, six weeks I could get my head around, because we used to go away in the summer for six weeks every year. And we got back together again after six weeks, so that wasn't such a bad deal. So I said, okay. And we got on the train, we traveled all night, and we picked up kids from small towns and from bigger, t uh, uh, small cities, and we were picking up kids all the time. Most of the kids on the train <coughs> were going to England, because England had undertaken to take 10,000 children over a period of time, whereas Holland was taking 1,500. And because they said that they couldn't afford to do more, although the kids were paid for in various ways. So as we picked up kids, you know, we stopped when the train stopped, the Germans would get on and they would harass us all the time. And, and so we couldn't really sleep, and we were really tired. But we got to the Hook of Holland in the morning, and the nice Dutch ladies were there with hot chocolate and donuts, and fed us, 
And the English kids got on a ferry and went to England, to Harwich. Can I have that? I just wanted to show you one more thing. You see the, what happened to the synagogue afterwards, you see it? I didn't see this happen. This happened after I left. Now, but you see in the background, there are some oval windows, the arched windows. That's my building. And that's still standing, that hadn't been touched. And the thing is that the last time I was there, really for any length of time, with my daughter <laughs> and my daughter-in-law, was in 1996. And we walked into the apartment because it was lunchtime and it was open and we called hello, 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 and nobody answered. And as we walked in, I was pointing out things from the entrance hall to my daughter. And I was crying. And she and I said, where's the kitchen? And she went where the kitchen should be. And it was a classroom. And she said, Mom, stop crying. There is a real reckoning here. It's a school. And it's a school that is of the most religious Jewish schools there is. And she said, that is a reckoning. And you should be glad that this is, has happened. And to this day, the school is there. They're renovating it right now because my daughter was there a couple of weeks ago. And they were renovating the, uh, the apartment, uh, the, the school that was. So, next slide, please. So we get to Holland, my brother and I, and we, we're about 120 kids, maybe a little more, maybe 150. And this school is converted for us into dormitories, classrooms, and um, mess halls. And we are there for six weeks from December 10th, 1938, until January of 1939. They don't know our medical histories, they don't have them, so they started to give us shots that you get from babyhood on until you reach the right age. And they also started to show us some things of Dutch culture and they were very, very good to us, and they really wanted us to, uh, to get to know them and to get to know the culture. So in January, we moved into three, we were divided into three groups and we moved. And it was, um, it was interesting because one group was all girls, so if they were sisters, they went. One group was all boys, so if they were brothers, they went. And one group was my group, where we were sisters and brothers. And next slide, please. And we were moved into this beautiful, beautiful house. About 60 or 70 of us. I always thought there were more until I went to see it uh, again. Uh, my, my husband took us, he took me for our 25th anniversary. And when I saw it, I said, no way could there be 100 kids up in here, maybe 60, maybe 70. But <clears throat> it was outside of The Hague, and it was in a lovely setting, in a park setting. Actually, people used to come out on weekends for picnics, and the plantings were gorgeous, as you can well imagine. And there was a little fake lake, and it was lovely, lovely. Now, just imagine the three windows on top, see them? Those three windows will uh, had a slide, a big yellow slide out the window. It was a, a, a fire slide. But you know, we kids, we had no toys, we didn't have anything. So we used to take a piece of carpet, we used to sit three across and we went down, run around the back, go up the stairs and down. Those, those were our entertainments. Well, my parents wrote twice a week. I wrote back probably once a week. I kept all the letters and I gave them to the Holocaust Museum in Washington. They're there as part of a collection. And the letters were interesting, of course. They told us what was going on. They were in Vienna. Uh, my father was working away like crazy. 
and um, and things were from bad to worse, as I said, one injustice after the other. But they lived through it, and they were still at the apartment. And my father, as I told you, told me six weeks, and in each letter he used to say six weeks. Well, you know, even at 10, 11 by this time, I understood that this was ridiculous. And I said to him in one letter, I said, Papa, stop telling me lies. It's been four times six weeks already. And it, it tell me, give me an answer, tell me when. He said, I have no idea. And you'll have to just go day by day. And so I waited and waited and waited until we learned a whole lot of things. Um, learned, we each had a little piece of ground. We planted things. They had a farmer who came to show us how to plant things which we did. They brought teachers in to teach us because we weren't near a school. And we kept up with math and science and all the things that we used to have to keep up with. And they tried to teach us English and of course Dutch. My brother did pretty well with the Dutch, I didn't. But um, that, that's what it was and then uh, it, it, um, we, were, uh, we got news that we could go to the United States. My father had registered for the United States for a visa the day after Hitler marched into Austria, and it took 18 months. So by the end of August, we were supposed to go back to Vienna to be examined physically by the American embassy because they didn't want sick people here in this country, which you can understand, certainly not communicable diseases. So we were supposed to go back and get our visas. But what happened was, I think we were supposed to go back at the uh, very end of August, September 1st, you know what happened, the war broke out, they invaded Poland. And they said, then we're not sending the kids back into a war zone. Forget about it. But what they did do, instead of being in the country, they took us into the city, also into a beautiful, beautiful home. What I didn't know and found out many, many years later was that down the beach from where we were, from this house, was an air base, the only air base in Holland. And they knew that if something happened, like a war, and it looked like it at that point, uh, they would be attacking that air base and they didn't want us, you know, anywhere in the vicinity. So they took us into town. When we went into town, we started to go to school, at least I did. And I came back home one Friday afternoon and I hear them whisper about the Munchine kids and I asked them what was going on. And they said, tomorrow you go to America. I said, like hell I will, I'm not going to America. I'm going even further away from my parents. Where are my parents going to be? I said, I'm not going. And besides, we used to sleep on straw sacks. You, you know what those are. As besides, my straw sack just became comfortable. <laughs> so I am not going anyplace. Oh, yes, you are. Well, like everything else, yes, I was. So the next day, a Saturday, on October 15th, I was picked up with my brother by a, an official from the um, Dutch government, and he took us to Amsterdam to the um, German embassy. Um, well, we'll go to that later. And we got passports. And the passports were unusual. Uh, can we uh, do what's the, the next one? Yeah. The had a big red J on it, and each one was signed Ruth Sarah Munchine, because every Jewish girl and woman had assigned her name Sarah, and every man Israel in the middle. So that was a look. Okay, so we got those. And 
Then we went to the American Embassy for a green card. And we uh, were examined. And uh, that evening, October 16th, Saturday night, we went to Rotterdam, which is a port city in Holland, and where we got on a boat that was named the Rotterdam to the old Rotterdam to go to America. Well, I made up my mind before we got there that my parents were going to be there, that they would be at the boat, that we would go together. But of course they weren't, and I was devastated, absolutely devastated. But I got on the boat, and I kind of found out later that my mother had called the, the, um, um, the Dutch government, the ones who were in charge of us, and had said, you know, my, I have friends going on that boat, put the kids on. And they told her she was crazy. But my mother was one of those, and I'm sure some of you had mothers like that. You didn't say no to my mother. If mama said, you did. And so she called them every hour on the hour for two days until they finally said, we gotta get rid of this crazy woman. Put the kids on. So we got on. Now go back one slide, would you please? And this is one of my favorite pictures I have to tell to you. This was while we were in quarantine, the six weeks after we got to Holland. You see those suits we have, those athletic suits? Today they would be right in stock. Navy blue athletic suits, we were running all over town with them, and they all knew who we were and where we came from. This is the first time I ever saw a big body of water, because Austria is a landlocked country. We have plenty of lakes, but no, no big bodies of water, no seashore. And this is the first time I ever saw one, and I got very excited about that. I'm the one that's on the left of the, of the nurse, and my brother is the littlest one on the right of the nurse. So it's one of my favorite pictures that I always drag along wherever I go. So, okay, we're, we're finished right there. So, we get on the boat. I don't know, look at my time. We get on the boat and we go through the English Channel. The English Channel is heavily mined and we have to have a pilot to take us in and out. A storm breaks, a mother of all storms. The sky turned yellow, the sea turned yellow. And, I, and the boat was going like a toy. And I was seasick to start with already. So you can imagine. I went into the library, I sat down, I wrote a letter to my parents. I'm gonna die, this is goodbye. <laughs> And we'll never see each other again, but you were pretty good parents. Goodbye. <laughs> so, of course, never sent a letter. But the storm was over, and it had it done its damage. You know how these big liners have a, prop, a huge propeller in front to separate the water? Well, we lost a piece of this one. So our, the length of our uh, journey was... Um, uh, lengthened by three hour, uh, three days. So we got to the United States on October 26th. We left the 16th, 10 days. 10 days of being seasick like crazy. Somebody had given us boarding money, my brother and me, $2.40 each. But in those days, $2.40 was money. Because you came to America, you could get three rolls for a nickel. So. Now, $2.40 or something. I took my $2.40 and sent my parents a telegram that we were on board ship. I figured they better know. And then I had to pay for mineral water all the rest of the way because that wasn't part of the deal. And there was nothing else I could eat. So I paid for the minerals, $2.40 shot. But my two brothers, $2.40, I kept. And this time, my father was right. He said six weeks. They came in three weeks. We uh, came here on the 26th of October, and I got better when I saw that lady in the harbor here. Um, so I was fine then. And um, they came on November 17th. And my parents had um, 
I didn't know where the next hour was coming from because we, we were limited as to how much money you could take out, which was very fadant little. And so they built, they had built two crates and they had taken everything that they owned, every piece of clothing, dishes, pots, pants, whatever they had in the household because they had to set up a household here. So on top, well, anyway, so anyway, they were coming and we, were, we picked them up, my, my great aunt and I, who, with whom we were staying, who had picked us up. And they, we waited for the customs inspector and they opened it up and on top, a washboard. I said, Mama, what did you bring a washboard for? She said, look, I gotta do my own laundry now and I gotta have a washboard. So when the inspector saw it, he got hysterical laughing and he said, go. Just go. So we were able to leave. In the meantime, my father had to pay bribes in Trieste for the, uh, not in Trieste, in, in Genoa, for the boat, for, to get those crates on board because the longshoremen wouldn't do it. You know, they had taxes. So they, they didn't want to put anything on board unless you bribed them. And he had not a cent in his pocket. Flat broke. And I gave him the two dollars and forty cents. And he felt like a millionaire. You know, it's a proud man. He a really well provided for his family all, all their lives. And he and his big family, his brothers and sisters, everybody. And here we uh, here he had two dollars and forty cents in his pocket, which was really, really wonderful. So we, we stayed with, with my mother's aunt uh, till the end of the year until they were able to um, put a, an apartment together. And they did, and we moved in with them in January and we started school and my brother and I. And that's the story. Now when I tell this story to the kids here at the museum or I go to the schools, there is one thing that I, that I end with. And uh, I'll take questions later. Um, I tell them that, number one, when they see an injustice of any kind, whether it be bullying, whether it be words, whether it be physical, they should be upstanders, not bystanders. Because they got to say something, they got to do something. And if they can't do it by themselves, they should get somebody to do it with them, either a family member or a friend. And the other thing that I tell them about is, do you all remember that very uh, big massacre in Darfur uh, some years ago? And um, Michael Jackson and his friends wrote a song at that time and performed it in order to get money to help and it was called, Let There Be Peace on Earth and Let It Begin With Me. And I say to those children, you are the future. Let there be peace on earth and do start it because you can make the world better than you found it. And that's how I end my talk to the kids. First slide, please. Okay. Now I got a special treat for you. You see that classroom with the kids? I'm the one with the checkered blouse on the left, first row sitting, all the way over on the left. See it? Yeah. Now, move over and go into the middle, and you see that girl standing with a collar. The one in front of her, that's my friend, Avi Conrad. Avi Conrad heard about me last year and the museum put her in touch with me. And after 80 years, she found me and there she is. Find your friend at the age of, she's, she's younger, 
<laughs> uh, but to find a friend at the age of 91 is so special. And we just love each other, and we see each other as often as we possibly can. But look at her, isn't she fantastic? <laughs> she is. So, Amy, thank you for coming. You gave me such a pleasure. Thank you. Okay, and I've got family here, too. Uh, where are you? Where are you? Okay. Are there any questions? Because I'm not so good at hearing. So, you've got Samantha, that guy back there with a the mic. So, if you put your hand up, she'll come and chill. Thank you. I'm a little confused. You said something. You about, have to do it loud. Okay, I'm a little confused. You said something about giving your father the. I'm job. sorry, I can't hear you. Just, uh, give it to Samantha and she'll tell me. Uh, there's some confusion about the $2.40. Uh, she wants you to clarify, if you were here in the U.S., how did your father get the money? Okay. The, the story about the $2.40 is that I saved my brother's $2.40 morning uh, money, and I gave it to my father because he was totally penniless. He had paid all, this, all his money, whatever he had, cleared out his pockets in Genoa in order to get those crates on board. So giving him the $2.40 gave him something to put in his pocket. Thank okay. you. Anyone else? There's gentlemen over here. If you, if you, if you yell, I'll hear you. The, oh, the synagogue was a, a parking lot the first time I saw it in 1955. And then in 1996, when I went there with my daughter and my daughter-in-law, they were building a big thing, a big building. They had four stories of, of um, parking underneath, and then they had Jewish-oriented stores, uh, bookshops and, and uh, things of, of that sort and some food shops and stuff. And then the building, I don't know how high it is, but it's high for over there. It's a mixed use building for offices in the Jewish community and for apartments. So that's what they are doing it with, it with it right now. Yes? Have you lived in New York all your life? And we, when we came here, we came into Bed-Stuy. My aunt, my great aunt, had a um, um, brownstone there. And we lived with her until January. Then in January of 1940, we moved to Williamsburg. And uh, of course, now you can't afford a, 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 a door knock there. But in those days, I couldn't wait to get the heck out. So uh, we lived there for 10 years. And then and when I started, to earn money, we moved into Flatbush. And I got married out of Flatbush and lived in Manhattan ever since. Yes? Uh, would you be willing to talk about the Anschluss and were you surprised at the eagerness that the Austrian people wanted you to join? You know, I was only 10 years old and I will never understand it. And I don't understand it now. And I think they're all crazy. And I will tell you that the Austrians were far worse than the Germans, and still are. That's <laughs> well, all I can tell you. How many synagogues were destroyed on Christmas? A hundred. Or 99. There were a hundred in Vienna. There was one that wasn't. And I'll tell you why. It was attached to the Jewish community offices where my father worked. And the front was just like the office buildings. You couldn't see it, but that wasn't the reason. You know a name like Eichmann? Yes. Okay. Mr. Eichmann's apartment abutted the back of the synagogue, oh. and he told them not to burn it because it would hurt his apartment. <laughs> Have we got a couple of minutes for me to tell them an Eichmann story? Yes. Would, you, would you be willing? Yes. yes. 
Okay. As I told you, I lived in an unusual building in an unusual situation. Above us, above our apartment, was the Jewish Theological Seminary, which trained rabbis for the whole country of Austria. And it also housed the library, which belonged with the seminary. The library, there had been Jews in Austria, and in Vienna particularly, for 400 years. The library had jewels in it. They were manuscripts of the best thinkers, the best philosophers, many of them handwritten. And they were really the most precious things. Well, a few days after the Anschluss, after March uh, 12th, we had a knock on the door. My, my brother and I and my best friend were in the house. My parents weren't, but the housekeeper was. And they asked the housekeeper for, uh, this man asked the housekeeper for the keys to the library. He went upstairs. He stayed about two hours. He came down, he wanted to see the kids. Came into the room. My brother was really adorable. Blonde hair, blue eyes, you know, like a Nazi kid. And he <laughs> patted him on the head, chucked him under the chin, talked to us. My friend Sylvia, for some reason, didn't like this guy. And she started to, to sob. And my housekeeper, who was like four foot 10 and about 87 pounds soaking wet, she uh, pulled herself up to a full height. And she said, you're frightening the kids, go. So he gave her the keys and he said to her, I, uh, I'm taking certain things with me. Tomorrow the trucks will come and get the rest. Well, you know what they did when they trucked away all those books. They burned them. And as Heinrich Heine said in the 18th century, where they burn books, they will soon burn people. And boy, was he right. He was a German Jewish poet. Now, so he left, and I didn't know who he was. Comes 1961 and there's a trial in Jerusalem. And there are pictures all over the newspapers. And I said, oh my God, that's the guy. And it was Eichmann, who was in, he, he read Hebrew, by the way, he was no dummy. He read Hebrew, and he came to pick the best and the finest, and the rest to be burned. Now, why did he pick the rest, the best and the finest? What did they want with it? There was going to be a museum built in Prague after there were no Jews left in the world, and they were going to show what the civilization of Jews was like. So they had the artifacts for it. And that was my Eichmann story. I don't think you'll hear it from anyone else. I don't know whatever happened. Uh, the archives which was stored in the other building, you know, the one that was identical to mine, the archives were saved. Those were saved that I found out there many years afterwards. But, and they were the archives of the 400 years. And that's it. Yes. Hands over here. Just, just a mundane question, please. Your parents came from Genoa on another ship not the okay. one you took, is that correct? You'll have to yell. No, let, let, let uh, some answer. He's asking, um, your parents came on another ship? The what? Your parents, different. Your parents came on a different ship, correct? On the ship? Different one. The one that I was on? Yeah. Yeah, what about it? He was just getting some clarification. And then you met in New York. I landed in Hoboken, New Jersey, and I called it Hoboken. And, and you reunited in Hoboken? I landed in, in Hoboken on October 26, 1939. Great, right. Does that answer your question? That was your answer. How did your parents get out of Austria? My, my parents had the visas. You know, and my father had uh, uh, applied for it the day after Hitler marched in, and they just had to wait for the visas. They still wanted to get rid of them. 
So my father worked to the last day, and my mother, they were in the apartment all that time. Um, with the, with our, uh, um, um, with our housekeeper. And the only reason we could keep the keeper, she wanted to stay with us actually, was because she was over 50. If they were younger, they weren't allowed to stay with the Jews. Uh, you, you had mentioned that uh, 1,500 kids were taken. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You mentioned that 1,500 kids were taken to Holland, 10,000. Yes, yes, yes. So you, and you were fortunate that you went, you, you made your way to the U.S., before, I imagine, before, right. before the Germans invaded uh, Holland. Yeah, the next, the next um, few months, the right. April of 40, they, they, uh, Holland fell. And do you know what happened to the other 1,500 you know, children? That was one of the saddest days of my life. My husband took me um, on, a, on a trip to Holland in 1983 for our 25th anniversary. And I spent a whole day in the archive, and there wasn't a name in it. It was like we were all erased from this world. I, could, I came with my little address book that I had left with. Not one person did I find. And it was the saddest day, really, because I had expected to be able to connect with some. And it didn't happen. So you don't know what happened? I don't have any idea what happened. I do know about one. There was one kid that was standing on the other side of me, a little boy who was a friend of my brother's who I know got through the war through other people, I know that. He got through the war uh, and he was reunited with his mother. And that's all the only one that I know about. Um, I see a question here. In the uh, there's row. a question here. Yeah. When you came to America, what happened to the rest of your family in Austria? I can't hear that. When, your family in Austria. When you I, I had no one left in Austria, oh. no one at all. My father had one brother who went to England at the time that I was in Holland with his wife, and his uh, oldest brother was in Gdynia, um, uh, which was a free city on the a Polish corridor between Poland and Germany, and they were chased from one side by the, um, by the Germans and on the other side by the Russians. And they both lost their lives on the way, not through camps or anything, but through lack of food and um, infections and things like that. Anyone else? What Who else do you yeah. remember about Crystal now? What's that? What else do you remember about Crystal now? About crystal knot? Yes. What else is there to remember? <laughs> it wiped out my life as it was before. Can you expand on and that? And it wiped out the lives of all Jews who had been in Germany, Austria, or Czechoslovakia. There was no limit to what they could do to us. Whatever they thought they could do, whatever they thought of, like this guy who walked into my aunt's house and who said, get out, it's now my apartment. It worked in many cases. The um, businesses that, were, uh, uh, that had to be transferred for either no money or for as little money as possible, they took the businesses over. That's all I can remember. But, but what I told you about were the things that I experienced myself. Those are the things that happened to me. And, and I really can't add very much to that. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I wanted to ask, do you attend the Kinder Transport? Yes, I do. Yes, I do. Yes, yes, I do. I go to anything that is local, any local things. And they had last year was the 80th anniversary of the Kinder Transport. And they had a trip re replicating 
the, um, the journey from Vienna to um, Holland, to Hochapolland and then to England. And they had four survivors. So you know, I was 10, so even the youngest, who were about five, they have to be in their late 80s. And they had 14 second generation people. There were 18 people on the trip. And I just uh, gotten a write up of it. And it must have been, I'm so jealous that I couldn't go. But I can't do it anymore. How, yes. How did your parents adapt to America? My parents were great. My mother went to, to register us in school. And the principal said to her, you know, we have a school not too far away. It was maybe, this one was about three, four blocks from the house. The other one was maybe 10 blocks from the house. That is for kids like yours because um, they have, they, they'll understand languages. And my mother said, my kids are gonna learn English. And we went to the school that was nearest. And we learned English, it's my father. My brother, who couldn't understand, I, I at least had a few words, but he couldn't understand anything. He was seven, couldn't understand anything. And the teacher tried everything. She tried German, she, not German. That's the one she didn't know. She tried Yiddish, she tried everything else, and he kept saying yes, and he couldn't understand that. <laughs> My brother was a, a, a um, professor of biochemistry. He's 88 next week, as I told you, till two years ago. They called him a phenomenon. The minute his name went up on the class list, the class was full. Talented, caring, wonderful teacher. Wonderful sense of humor. Wonderful person. To this day, thank God. Um, we have, I'm sorry. We have time for two or three I, more I, questions. So. What? I How don't did hear. your friend get out of Vienna? What's that? How did your friend get out of Vienna? Your friend then is here. Yeah. She got out earlier. Later. Out of Vienna. You got first. At least one day. I was in Vienna one day in May 1939 on the way from Budapest to France. My father had gotten us a visa finally. My mother and I went through. And that was the last time I saw my grandmother. And it was horrible. I was so frightened. And I felt so guilty because I loved my grandmother, but I couldn't wait till we got out of there. And when I saw that uh, train outside, that, um, yeah, uh, that's how my grandmother died. I never saw her again after that day in May 1939. Yeah, thank you, Evie. Anyone else? There's a lady, yes, a gentleman like, back there. Like no, back there. She's coming. If you have to holler. Yes, I'm. I'm originally from Holland. I can't hear you. <coughs> but my parents are also from Vienna. They moved to Holland. Really? My mother was Jewish. But I would. I would like to know. Can you speak? Still Wienerisch. Nicht to need to nicht so good. She can't speak Vesa. And in which in which Bezirk haben Sie? Zweiten Bezirk. Welche? Zweiten. Zweiten Bezirk. Okay. Meine Großmutter war im 19. Bezirk. 19. Mein Onkel. Kennen Sie die Bielrotstraße? Yes. Da war meine da war meine Großmutter. Okay. Thank you very much. And your, and your, your German is real good. Ziemlich uh, gut, aber wir wohnen jetzt in Südafrika und da spricht man auch Afrikaans und das ist sehr verwandt an yes, Holländisch. Yes, yes, yes. Also das sind viele Sprachen. Yes. Ja. Aber das war sehr schön, was Sie alles ge gesprochen haben. Vielen Dank. Thank you. Thank you. I see a hand back there. Okay, um, this gentleman. She asked me if I knew the Viennese accent still, but not so good. But but Amy is terrific. My mother was born in 1927 in North, in Vienna, and she came over in December of 1939. I I would just like to note that 
more than half the population in Vienna, the Jewish population. I can't hear that right. But more than half the population of Jewish Vienna was eventually sent to the death camps. Not everybody was fortunate enough to be able to get out. Oh, I'm sorry, I can't hear you. My hearing is not as good as it ought to be. Um, uh, well, what, did you, what was that? It wasn't a question, it was just a comment. Uh, he was just commenting that more than half the population of Vienna was not so fortunate to escape that they were sent to, to the camps. Right, 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 absolutely. Um, I saw some, I saw a hand back here. Um, Samantha, you're getting your exercise. <laughs> uh, my parents uh, work from Austria, from Vienna, Austria. And uh, her, my mother's name was Edith Pisk, and my father's name is Siegfried Stapler. And the I'm story, sorry, I do not hear you. Edith Pisk was my mother's name, and Siegfried Stapler was my father's name. And the story that my mother told me is they were there at the day that Hitler marched into Vienna, Austria. And uh, they were arrested, and this is a story my mother told me, they were arrested and put in a local police station uh, as a holding cell before they would transport them to a death camp. But it so happened that one of the guards was my mother's former boyfriend and let them escape. And that's how they got out. That is really fantastic. <laughs> and, uh, and because my father's brother was planted in the United States many years before, that was their ticket to leave Austria and get into the USA. I was born in New York. Good. Wonderful. I'm so glad I'm hearing a lot of these people who were saved. Um. Okay, we can take one final question and then we'll wrap it up. I see a red vest right over here. You might have to shout because I... Were you able to speak to your children about the experiences? When they got to be around 10, yes. And um, my grandchildren, of course. And the nice thing is that I was able to speak at their schools. And one of their schools had them introduce me. So it was, you know, as you say, yes. And, uh, and, and in, in introducing me uh, at age 10 or 11, for them to have picked up certain things was really interesting. And now, when I speak here, as a matter of fact, I've got some stuff right now I was reading before I came down here from a class that I addressed of what they, what they uh, learned from me. Some, just a paragraph or so. You don't know what's going to stick. You really don't know what you're going to get from these children, but something does stick. And that's what I'm so pleased about. I addressed 300 kids last Thursday. Wow. And, uh, wow. did, you, did you have another question? I was wondering if you knew anything that stuck to the kids. If I what? If you knew things that the kids remember. Yeah, but they, 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 it's some of them. So not every teacher does it. But some, I got it. I had two, I'm not. I had 70 kids across the street, the, the school right here across the street, at the end of last uh, semester. And um, they sent me a box of chocolates because they knew that I had to give up my chocolates. <laughs> in Holland. And they sent me a box, and the box says love on top, and a note from every child. And I could only read 10 at a time or so because I was crying the whole time. Because some of those kids wrote like poets or like, like novelists. And some of them drew pictures that were so artistic. And they were just, you know, you, this, is what, this is what gives you the will to do these things. And some of them have such talented teachers who give them so much 
and prepare them so well for the kind of things that I'm going to tell them that it's unjust, you know, just un unbelievable. And that's why I love doing this so much. And thank goodness the, uh, the museum here, particularly, gives me the opportunity to do two or three a month, sometimes more. And last week, and this week's out, this is the fourth one I'm doing. And I'm doing another one at the CV University on Wednesday night. Thank you so much, Ruth. Yes, thank you. Thank you.